said, Bob Parker, he said that self-righteous people were jackasses. He, said, he wrote that. He wrote that. Okay. And man, some people got mad and left his church because he said that word. You know that word's biblical. I can give you a lot of biblical words. All right. So it's biblical. Well, he got up here in the pulpit and he said that Tuesday night. Not once. Not twice. Not three times. He was having fun saying it. Well, on the next day, we having lunch. I looked at him and said, Pastor Rick, let me ask you a question. Did you say, ever say that word in your pulpit in your church? And he said, no, I just wrote it on Facebook. I never said it in my church. I said, so you feel the liberty here. And he said, Pastor, let me tell you, we got you on tape. In my church, in five minutes, saying three cuss words. And I'm not going to tell you what any of them were. But they were rougher than jackass. And I said, I have no recollection of any of that. And they said, well, we got you on tape, son. You were defending your love for me and vice versa. So it, it, was, a, it was a blessing to have him here. He did such a marvelous job sharing on the soul and on Wednesday night preaching on blessing. Amen. Got your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews the 10th. You know what I, I love? I love the fact that you love the people I love. Amen. That just means so much to me that men and uh, women that I know that have preached the gospel, you guys have been so kind toward them. And uh, Be praying for my pastor, Mike Van Britson. His wife's had knee replacement, and she's just having a difficult time. And if things don't go well enough, he won't be able to be here next month. Don't worry. I got, I got standbys everywhere. But I'm still praying he can get here. Amen. So pray for Sister Patty that she gets well. He told me that this morning. And he's just doing so well. And thank you, uh, Brother David, for praying for Pastor Ron Eagleton. Bishop Ron Eagleton, Mount Rose Church of God in Christ of Barrett Station, Texas. Amen. He's just got a big old long name. Love him. Talk to him this week for an extensive time. He will reopen his church on uh, uh, Easter. They have been closed since March of last year. So that's, a, that's crazy, and we've been open. Amen. So I thank God that we've been open, and we're, we're bucking the system as far as that 30% goes. Most churches that have opened up after pro-COVID uh, have a 30% attendance now. Amen. And another 30% won't come back to church, and the other 30% say they're going to stay home watching on TV from now on. I'm glad y'all like to come to church. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad you're watching online, too. That doesn't bother me. we got people watch all over the United States and now reaching out across the world. So that means a lot. We've, we've expanded our reach and we'll continue. Dennis, I thank you, sir, for staying up late last night, 2 o'clock in the morning, putting these new cameras up in the building. Amen. We don't have the, they're not hooked up yet, but they will be. But, uh, man, we got a brand new live stream coming and it's going to be amazing. I'll be in 3D. And they say that those cameras will take 10 pounds off of me. So I'm very excited about that. H, how about you, man? It's going to be, you need to start wearing stripes. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, are you comfortable? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, Paul speaking to the church, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Let's stop there a minute. How many times have we realized that in the gospel in our lives, we've got to stand our ground, amen, and not give in, not back up, but to either stand or press forward in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You know, sometimes we've been persecuted or, or something has happened publicly to expose us, but here's the other thing is that we stand with others who have gone through it. You'll often find, I call that a fellowship of pain. When you've stood, and now you're standing with others who need somebody to stand with them. You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Do you know how you sympathize with people in prison? When you've been in prison yourself. Now, I haven't been in prison. I've been in jail, though. And I tell you what, it changed my whole perspective. I had a, such a uh, tremendous time in jail. I was, many of you know I was pro, uh, arrested for protesting against abortion three times. And finally I had to serve a sentence in that. And they put us in, a, in the incarceration in Austin where there were people who were murderers, thieves, and I won't go into the rest of it. 
But the bottom line was to try to break us and to stop us from ever protesting against abortion again. While I was there, I made friends with guards. I made friends with prisoners. I preached 21 out of 22 straight days in the, in the, uh, the pod that I was in. I led people to Jesus. One of y'all, you will remember, is Carlos Bertigas, who was a part of my life for many years until he was murdered on 610. Uh, I've, I've had people defend me while I was there. And when, before I left prison, jail, TDC in Austin, the guards came up and thanked me for coming. Did you hear that? They thanked me for coming. And I had a hard time leaving. I didn't like the humiliation of it. There are things that I won't talk to you about. Uh, but there was, there's, there's some humiliation that goes on with it when, you, when you're a grown man. And you've got to deal with it. There's female guards that are in the place. You know, so you've got to deal with things in, in, that go on. But you just deal with it. But on the flip side of it, I thank God. So when I read what Paul wrote here, you sympathized with those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. How many know what we've done here matters there? Amen. And that we're sending our possessions on ahead. Amen. That everything we do here is sending on. In, in other words, they had a revelation that, that moth and rust cannot corrupt the treasures we send into heaven. And the question will always be, Pastor, why do we need treasures in heaven? Why do we need an inheritance in heaven? I'm going to answer that with a I don't know. Is that all right with y'all? I don't know all the answers. I don't know anybody else that does. All I know is it's going to matter what we've done here. And then when we get there, there will be treasures. There's going to be something for us to do. You know, it's not just going to be a... It's as fun as this has been down here. Imagine what heaven's going to be like with all the stuff you sent up there by giving things away, by uh, allowing things. It says here they stuff was confiscated from them, was taken from them. Now there's things that get stolen from you, but when they confiscated, is when the government takes stuff that don't belong to them. Amen. And when you learn how to release things, amen. All of a sudden, now joy can come into your life because you say, you know what? I got I got a better life coming up. Amen. So he says, because you knew that yourselves, you had better and lasting possessions. Verse 35. Do not throw away your confidence. Everybody say confidence. confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will not, uh, will come and will not delay. But my righteous will live by faith. Speaking out of the book of Habakkuk, Sola Fadai, amen, living by faith. Amen, believe in God. Faith is some, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I've not seen it yet, but I'm believing God for it. It comes with your healing. It comes with your possessions. It comes with relational issues. Amen, faith does all of that. It breaks into your life. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who believe and are saved. Amen. This morning I want to preach on healing the shrinks. Come on. How many know some folk get the shrinks? I, come on, I said some folk get the shrinks. Yeah. Amen. They hit something in their life, they can't stand anymore, they shrink back. Amen. Something gets confiscated, they shrink back. Friends leave, they shrink back. Their faith starts going down, they shrink back. What I found in life is that people can get to shrink so easy. Little things can make people shrink. Amen. You just shrink. You just begin to wither back. It's important. After 40 years doing this, 27, 28 years of pastoring, I can tell you I have watched folk come to. You think COVID's bad? You watch out for shrinks. Amen. Because when the shrinks hit, you start losing your faith. And watch this. Your faith is connected to your confidence, your confidence to your reward. And the last thing I want to do is lose my reward because I shrunk. Whoo, come on, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Bless the word to the people in Jesus' name. Everybody shout. Amen. Amen. He says here, don't throw away your confidence. You can throw away your doubt, your pessimism, your meanness, please, your unforgiveness, but your faith, your confidence, hang on to it. Confidence, my friend, is a, a plan of slow growth. Amen. It takes a little while to grow in your life, but once you got it, I've often said this, I don't always know what confidence is. But I know when it ain't. Amen. I can see when confidence ain't on people. The word confidence is not on the overhead, but you can write this down. Confidence is the feeling or belief that you can rely on someone or something. The state of feeling certain about the truth of something. Let me say it again. 
Confidence is the feeling or belief that you can rely on someone or something. The state of feeling certain about the truth of something. I'll break that down even better. Confidence is to rely on something greater than you. Just rely on something greater. What? Rely. To rely on something greater than you. The power of confidence, when once a saint puts his confidence in the election, the salvation of God, no tribulation or affliction can ever touch that confidence when we realize that there is no hope of deliverance in human wisdom or in human opinion or in anything that we can do. This is the finest cure for spiritual degeneration or spiritual sulks or shrinks. When I say this right here, this long statement here, I want you to realize that today we're hearing about human wisdom and human opinion. So when I preach, I want to preach out of the Word of God and I have confidence. I don't have confidence in going to Mars. <laughs> it's billions of dollars of waste for me to get a picture of something red. Amen. I mean, it really is. I mean, and people don't about wanting to go and pay millions and millions of dollars to fly out somewhere and live somewhere else. Do you, if you ever travel to the United States and realize how much land we have unoccupied? Amen. Amen. It's a whole lot cheaper. I had a friend told me, he said, Pastor, for $40,000, I can buy 15 acres in Ure, Colorado. I said, you better look at it. It's probably straight up hill. Amen. You better look for it. But I'm telling you, there are places to stay. There are places to go. So I look at human wisdom and human opinion, and I see a lot of that on social media and I, on the news, and I realize that this year there are two things that I pretty much got delivered from. One is the news. I've gotten delivered from news. I just want, and used to, I watch the news for, you know, local happenings, sports, or weather. Now I'm only concerned about the weather. The second thing I got delivered from was sports, except for college football. <laughs> Amen. But the rest of that, I just let go, man. I just got to let it go. I don't have no, uh, it, it doesn't appeal to me. I don't even want to see, I don't even want to see it on my TV. I just, I, I can't do it. So confidence, confidence versus condemnation. And there's a difference. Condemnation is the greatest enemy to confidence. First John 3.20 says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us, then, uh, then have we confidence toward God. So confidence, my friend, tells me that it was the blood of Jesus that saved me. Now, many of you, I know, I, I, I give altar calls. You lift your hand, and, and you're asking God to save you again. And I thought last week you lifted your hand. And I love you, man, but I'm going to tell you something. Confidence to take all that away from you because condemnation has been beating you up. Amen. Your con condemnation got up in your heart and said you're not saved. Amen. God's greater than that. The blood of Jesus is greater than that. Amen. Your faith in God is greater than that. You've got to believe that if you gave your life to Jesus last Sunday, amen, you're good this Sunday. Amen. amen. You've got to live by faith. Why? Because if you don't, you'll shrink. And you don't want to shrink back. You don't want to fall back. It is impossible to have confidence and condemnation at the same time. Quit condemning yourself. Quit beating yourself up. Quit reminding yourself of your past or what you went through, the, the divorce you went through, the failure of children. Yeah, I'm going to promise you, there's not a soul in this place that raised kids and said to themselves, well, I did everything right. If you are, I want to meet you after church. Because I'm going to hug you and ask you to pray for me again. Amen. Because I thought I did some good stuff. But then every now and I look back and say, man, I, you know, I wish I could have done. I was back in the back and Tony said, she got her little kids. She said, I'm already saying that. My kids ain't even six years old yet. <laughs> Amen. Confidence is a powerful thing. The power of your heart. If your heart condemns not, your heart is your soul. Pastor Rick talked about it on Tuesday. It's your soul. It's your emotions. It's your mind. Amen. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if I'm walking after the Spirit, doing the things God's called me to do, my heart is not condemning me. There is no condemnation on me. Verse 33 and 34 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who has raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. I can't get away from some of the things Pastor Rick said on Tuesday night when he talked about labeling and how people label you and act like you're not saved or, or you don't know Jesus anymore. Who justified you? Jesus justified you. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, he justified you. The word means just as if I never sinned. It is an amazing thought because you know as I do, you have sinned. Yeah. 
You've missed the mark. You stumbled. Amen. Some of you didn't get here today before you missed the mark. Amen. I just saw somebody drive into our parking lot at 55 miles an hour. I could call that sin or running late to church. Either way, it's God who justifies us. Can I get an amen? amen? Why is that so important? First, Jesus died for us. And when you act like that, he hasn't. By living in the shrinks or falling back all the time or, or condemning yourself and beating yourself up and putting yourself down. Amen. What kind of love is that? I told somebody the other day, hey, this, ain't, uh, this is not popular. But the book of Ephesians tells women to submit to their husbands. It's what all it says. Women, submit to your husbands. Oh, man, I thought about preaching this. I guess I am right now, ain't I? Women, submit to your husband. And then he goes on to say, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now think about how much he loved the church. How much he cared about the church. Amen. How much love he has. He, and then he goes on to say, because he died for it. He died for the church. Amen. That's great love. So it's one thing for a man to tell a woman to submit. Another thing for a woman to say, love. Amen. Like Jesus did. Amen. Amen. Now get up out from under there. <laughs> Fight like a man. <laughs> Having confidence in the face of intimidation is important. Hebrews 10, 35 says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has a great recompense and reward. Confidence, all outspokenness, that is frank and full of assurance. It's not arrogant, amen, it's just full of assurance. It's attached to your confession. The tale of two kings here, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, tells of a war between Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, which we will call the enemy, and Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And the scripture says, later when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? They had dammed up the water. Amen. Here they were under siege by Sennacherib. And he couldn't figure out, why ain't y'all coming out? Why ain't y'all giving up? Why ain't y'all just, we've got you surrounded. There's no way you want to win this. You're under siege. We can starve you out in just weeks and months and keep you right here. So I'm asking, where are you basing your confidence? Who it came from? Sennacherib literally means the thorn. How many know uh, uh, that thorns are always threatening? If you've never ran through a briar patch, you ain't country. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you to run through there and then thorns grab you. I call them wait a minute vines. <laughs> Amen. You run through there and all of a sudden one grabs you and says, wait a minute. Amen. You've got to stop and pull the vine out and the thorn out. That's Sennacherib. He's just a thorn. Amen. Uh, the purpose of the threat was simple. A threat is an expression of an intention to inflict evil or damage. He was threatening them. A menace, one that represents a threat. The purpose of a threat is to cause fear in your life. Over the last year, we have been threatened. Do you know why one of the things that, that many of us have been bothered more by than anything else? Thinking our government is going to take our rights away from us. And because of that, we feel threatened. It wasn't, because, it wasn't that we didn't want to wear a mask. It was that we were told to. Come on. Amen. It wasn't that the fact we didn't think we believed in them. We've gone to hospitals to see masks work. And then they said, you've got to stay six foot apart. We were told to. All of a sudden, we were told we couldn't go to the restaurant. Told we couldn't go to the movies. Told we couldn't go to church. We were told, and all of a sudden, we felt threatened. And when we feel threatened, and then the great thing about America... We don't take threats easy. Oh, no. We, we, our back stiffen up. We get a little bit of spine in us. We say, you know what? I can only take so much of these threats. And so when Sennacherib threatened Hezekiah, the man of God, the, the king, amen, of Judah, he, he began to take it seriously. You know, fear and faith have something in common. Both believe that what you cannot see will happen. Let me say it again. Fear and faith have something in common. Both believe what you cannot see will happen. Don't be afraid of a day that you've never seen. Our worst imaginations also almost never happen, and most worries die in vain anticipation. Man, we worry and worry and worry, and it never happened. Amen. Fear keeps you running from something that ain't after you. When I was a kid, I was fear-based. 
Man, I was so scared. I'd watched enough Frankenstein and werewolf movies, them black and white ones, because that's the only kind of TV we had. That's not true. My dad had this thing that revolved. And, and no, he didn't. He had a screen. That, that's, the revolving thing went on the Christmas tree. But then he had a red screen he could put in front of the black and white TV. It did give us red people. <laughs> he had a blue screen he put in front of it. It gave us blue people. He had a, this is a true story. He had a green screen he could put in front of the TV. We got Martians. Mm. And I was always scared. I'd go in and do a door and I'd look between the cracks, see if anything was behind the door. Nothing could he get behind the door. But I still peek behind the door. I'd go to bed at night and I'd look underneath the bed and see if something was under the bed. Oh, you say, Pastor, are you serious? I was scared, man. I've been told about the legend of Boggy Creek. Went to the theater, Marble Drive In, to watch the legend of Boggy Creek. And he was like a Sasquatch's cousin. So I went to watch that, and they shook that bill, and it scared me. So I remember one day I, I went out in the woods all by myself with a flashlight. And I stood out there in the woods. And you see, it ain't like around here. Around here, y'all got that light that comes from the city. Up on the mountain, you ain't got nothing but stars. I'm out in the woods all by myself. And I turn that flashlight off, and I'm facing my fear. Whew. Whew. Man, I ran back to the house as quick as I could. You know when I got over my fear when I met Jesus? Faith came up in me and I realized they'd not be afraid of. They'd done for me to fear. Amen. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. So I just want to go Bible. Hallelujah. What did God do for me? Power, love, sound mind. Amen. That's what he did for me. Power, love, and sound mind. See, fears bring threats. Threats lock you out of your future. Threats confine you from expanding. They intimidate you out of your purpose. Will keep you from God. Connections of life. How many connections have we missed out of fear? The threats will limit you and keep you from taking risk. They'll shut you out of your promises, promises of God. And they'll cause you to develop a siege mentality. Amen. Overly fearful attitude. That quarantine. That lockdown. To stay away. Amen. That's what they do. And the enemy recognizes confidence. Second Chronicles 32.10. This is what Sennacherib King of, of Assyria said. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? The situation under siege. Quarantine. Lockdown. A military blockade of a city or fortified place to compel it to surrender. you got to give in. you got to give up. you got to shrink back. The enemy knew he had him. Amen. But could not ignore their confidence. The question, wherein do you trust in the King James Version? Where are you hiding for refuge or fleeing for protection? Where is your confidence coming from? Here it comes. Amen. The answer is 2 Chronicles 32, 7. Be strong. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is greater power with us than with him. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. With him is only, listen, with him is only the arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help and to fight our battles. And the people gain confidence from what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. I was talking to my pastor and Joseph on the way over here. And I realized that people follow confidence. If you're not confident in what you believe in and what you're selling and what you're confessing. Amen. People pick up on that. They know when you're not confident. I got, got on my Harley yesterday, me and Jay. And we had to ride out to my friend's um, his wake, a friend of mine passed away. He was 57 years old. Amen. I have never got on my, if, on my Harley without confidence. You know why I've got confidence? Because I look back to when I was 12 years old. And we bought a Honda 160 for $20. David was locked up. My dad hooked it to a chain in the front forks of that thing and drug me around in a field. And I kept popping it in second gear till that thing went pop, 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 and started fired off. And, and once it fired off, I rode the fool out of that thing, man. Amen. I jumped stuff. I set bricks up. Amen. I can't tell you, but no more than three bricks high is good enough, by the way. Amen. I jumped things. I jumped ditches. I got scars on my legs from wrecks. Amen. I would ride that motorcycle all over the place. I enjoyed it. So when I get on my bike today, I have tremendous confidence because when I was 12, I started riding. I learned how to slide that.
that bike. And since I have laid my Harley down, you know that. I've laid it down several times. I've slid that bike. But I learned how to slide. Don't ask me how I know. I learned. Amen. I learned through life. That's where confidence comes from. I watch my daughter on a horse. And I say, dear Lord, I don't know how she's running that horse that fast. Why? Because she has confidence from the time she is six years old being on a horse, riding that thing at full speed and pulling that thing back and yelling, whoa. Amen. Their confidence comes from that. Many of you have walked with God for years. Amen. You've had lean times. You know what it was like when stuff come up missing in your life. You know what it was like when relationships fell apart in your life and you still had enough confidence to keep pressing on. Confidence is to rely on something greater than you. Amen. And here Hezekiah told these people, guys, listen, we're going to not depend on the arm of the flesh. They're a bigger army than us, but we're going to depend on God here. So 2 Chronicles tells us in chapter 32, verse 20, Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, amen, at a Tuesday night prayer meeting, cried out to God in heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel... One angel annihilated all the fighting men and the leaders and the officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he, Sennacherib, withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons cut him down with a sword. Whew. Now who got confidence? Amen, hey, well, what a great victory. There's a tremendous thing when you understand and you believe God. Amen. You're not going to back away. The reservoir of confidence inside of you. Remember how you made it through. Look back. Again, remember those early days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult, persecution. Other times you stood side by side with those who were treated. You suffered along with those who were in prison, joyfully accepting the confiscating of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Paul is speaking to a group of people who are struggling. And he's telling them, guys, don't cast away your confidence. Amen. And don't you shrink back. Remember those early days. Remind yourself. Bring to your mind. I go back in my mind before this building was purchased. And we were meeting in a funeral home. God gave us that funeral home for two years to use. Amen. We didn't shrink back because we walked in and saw a dead body up front. We just moved it aside with all the other dead bodies that came into church to have them church that day. <laughs> but we had church in that building, my friend. Amen. I, you know, anytime I've started a church, it was, the, it was confidence that carried us. If we didn't have confidence, you can't do this thing. Amen. You've got to believe God for the best. You've got to hang on to it. You've got to keep over and over. When finances were lean, you've got to hang on and keep believing that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the gold under it. Amen. You've got to know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and you're one of his kids. And favor follows whoever's favoring the Father. And as long as I'm favoring the Father, i got favor. Amen. I was, at a, I was at a restaurant the other day, and we just walked in. And before I sat down, the place filled up right behind me. And I said, look at us bringing a crowd. <laughs> Amen. Happens like everywhere we go. Amen. Remember those early days. You endured a great conflict full of suffering. You held up. You remained. You fortified. King James uses the word afflictions. Emotional hardship and pain. Even, even though you were the gazing stock. I, I hate the thought that I have been a gazing stock. That people have looked and, you know, and, and just gazed at me. And even yesterday, I was at a place that, that had a little intrepidation about going. But as soon as I got there, confidence carried me. Because I know who I am. I know what I've done. I, I know what God's doing in my life. So my head's held high. And everybody knew it when I got there. Amen. As we began to share and talk and, and uh, hug. And I found out my the embrace. The embra embracing, I thank God for embrace. I had a little girl come up to me and give me a hug. She ain't saw me in 20 years. But she walked by and heard my voice turn around. She said, Pastor Jerry? She didn't recognize how good looking I'd gotten over the years. But she knew my voice. Amen. She just held on to me. Just held on. We just cried together. Amen. There's something powerful. Amen. About, about knowing that. Yeah, this, this thing here where Paul said, even though you were a gazing stock, you were exposed to a public show, you were a spectacle. Even though you lost your possessions, you held on. Why? Knowing in yourself that you have a heaven and a better and enduring substance. Why do we hold on to our confidence? I'm going to tell you why. It's for a reward. Now, if God just said, you're not going to hell, how many know that's good enough? Come on. 
Amen. Well, let's talk about hell real quick. It's a forgotten place for forgotten people who forgot. Hell's a forgotten place. We forgot it was there. For forgotten people, you and I have family and friends who are there. Who forgot? What did they forget? They forgot there was ever hell to start with. And when you forget there's a hell, you live like it. Amen. Hell is a place where the worm doesn't die. You can say, well, that's just figurative. You say whatever you want. Hell is being separated from Christ. Hell is being separated from the presence of God. Hell is a place of no hope. Hell is a place for Satan himself. Amen. And all the fallen angels. So I believe that there is a hell. Amen. I have to believe that. Amen. When I read it over and over. And I, I read the, the pain of it all. And, and let me be honest with you. I hope I'm wrong. I hope all them inclusionists and all them knotheads out there that are preaching there is no hell and God is so much love and everybody's going to go to heaven. Amen. Oh, happy day. I hope, when we, you know, I hope, that's, I hope they're right. That means when I get to heaven, I'll be with Hitler. Are you hearing me? I'll be with every mass murderer who never repented, every rapist that never repented, every baby molester that never repented. You say, well, no, no, Pastor, you don't understand. That's mercy. I said they never repented. They never got right with God. There's a hell for people like that. Amen. And when I think about hell and what it's going to be, I, that, that, to be away from that is enough. But to get heaven, the kingdom, with rewards. Rewards. You guys blessed me on my birthday. You so abundantly blessed me the next Sunday after church. I'm going to fly to Colorado with my son to go get my grandkids and go snowmobiling. Why? Because y'all blessed me. You rewarded me for just turning 60. Unbelievable. For being the knothead pastor that cusses in other people's churches. You've blessed me. Oh, my goodness. I can't imagine what heaven is going to be like and the rewards that God has for them who don't shrink back but have confidence in Him. Confidence produces the reward. Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. I can't even please God unless I believe for something that is invisible. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. I, yes, I serve an invisible God, a powerful God. Yes, I do a reward, a remunerator to give for services rendered. God, how, what have I done to deserve this? It was your son's blood that did this for me. And yet, because I just believe... You're going to bless me? Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. I sat back in confidence and I said, now first let me talk about me, that God in November the 10th, 1979, started a work in me, and he's not done with me yet. It's taken all this time just to get here, to mature to just this spot. But I look at other people and I say, hold on now. God started to work in your life. I remember that church service. I remember that youth camp. I remember what God did at that revival. I remember on that bike ride what God did. Being confident of this, that he that started a good work in you, Sherman, ain't going to stop. Amen. That even if you try to shrink back, God said, I'm still pulling. I'm still yanking on you. Amen. You know what that does? That gives you tremendous confidence with your kids. Your grandkids, amen, those that are far away from you, I still have this confidence. Sometimes I'll hear my kids talk, and I just go, in, well, I'm just like they were when they were teenagers. It goes in one ear and out the other ear, my ears. I ain't listening. Hey, Daddy, you're not even listening to me. No, I ain't listening to you. Because you ain't talking the way I'm seeing. What I see is God doing a work in your life. Amen, I see good things. I see good things. So I stand on this verse. Confidence, rely on something greater than me. Amen. So I'm going to rely on God. Amen. This very thing that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a good work. Work is not a dirty word. Amen. Hebrews 3.14. We are made partakers of Christ. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. 1 John 5.14. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, who uh, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him because we will receive the full reward. So confidence is connected to the reward. Let me close with this. Confidence produces the reward. The shrinks remove the favor. So the way that you get confidence is through the Word of God. 
First, reminding yourself of where you came from and how far God has brought you. To keep reading the Word of God and realizing all the promises that God made to you, for you, are yours. Now, not all promises are yours. Everybody hear me? Not all promises are yours. There are some promises to people that are going to hell. Because there used to be a song. Every promise of the word is mine. Every, book, every, every sentence, every paragraph, every line. And we'd sing that and I'd go, ah, not every promise is mine. Hey, Amen. I don't want every promise in that book. Uh, but I do want the ones that are connected by faith. Amen to me. Who's he talking to? Now the just shall live by faith. It's so hard to live by faith in such a seen world. We got to see things to believe in. But Thomas, Thomas didn't believe what Peter said when he said Jesus resurrected. He said, I, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And the Bible says that Jesus, first off, he didn't use the door after his resurrection. He walked through the wall. Now let me just help you just a little bit. Do you understand what heaven going to be like? Just. That stopped me. But this is temporary. This is temporary. And when God gives me a new earth suit. If Jesus passed through the wall. I'm passing through the wall. I did that, I did that. That's like Marvel. Or something. Something crazy. But he didn't use the door. Somebody said, why well, didn't use the door? Because he is the door. So he just walked. Well, yeah, I don't need the door. I am the door. So I just walked through. I'm the way, the truth, and life. Anybody get to the Father, got to come through me. He said, what's through there? And this Thomas. And Jesus holds out. And this is the thing. As we, we're one month from Easter. And Jesus held out his hands. And he showed his scars. The only thing man made in heaven will be the scars the Romans put on Jesus. Only thing man made. We get there, we get a new body. There's nothing here on earth that God needs in heaven. But when Jesus got there, he kept this. He, he could have got that new body and those scars, but he wanted to prove, that, yes, I am. And Thomas doubted and he held out his arms and he said, my Lord, my God, now I believe. You know what Thomas was dealing with? The shrinks. And the more you go through life, and the harder life hits you, I can't imagine any more suffering than what the Hebrew people were going through there when he said they confiscated your goods. You, you understood prison life. You, you were made a, a gazing stock. They laughed at you for being Christian. Amen. All these things. But you didn't shrink. Don't you shrink. But you, your confidence. Hold on to your confidence. Amen. Don't throw it away. Because it has a great. Well, the book, of, the message says, remember those early days after you first saw the light? Those were some hard times. Hard times. You were kicked around in public. Targets of every kind of abuse. Some days, it was you. Other days, it was your friends. If some friends went to prison, you stuck by them. If some enemies broke in and seized your goods, you let them go without a, with a smile, knowing they couldn't touch the real treasure. Nothing they did bothered you. Nothing set you back. So don't throw it all away now. Hey, don't throw it all away now. You might have come in here just hanging on with your faith. Don't throw it all away now. You were sure of yourselves when... It's still a sure thing, but you need to stick it out. Stay in with God's plans so that you'll be there for the promised completion. Mm, let's pray. Father, right now, I thank you that confidence is a slow growth. But I sense it rising up in us. God, I stand right now among people. No more shrinks. Healed right now in Jesus' name of the shrinks. No more falling back. And I reach for those online. And I speak to you. And I tell you, step up, 
stand and then step forward. Look back and remember how far God has brought you. He's been a good, good God. Amen. Like he did for Hezekiah, he'll stand for you. Amen. You might have felt like you've been in siege this whole year. You've been shut down. But I'm telling you, God's fixing to bring you out. Amen. I believe for a better year ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Woo! How many feel like the shrinks just left you? Amen. I'm, I'm, uh, next week, we're going to have folk come back in this church we ain't seen in a while. I believe that with all my heart. I'm just going to stand here and believe it. Amen. And God's going to bring folk in this church that have had the shrinks and all of a sudden they got healed. Hallelujah. The faith built back up again. A good word to, this morning. I woke up and there on my phone was a, a report from Natalia, nurse, uh, Josiah Ramirez's wife. She's a nurse at Kingwood Hospital. Uh, that uh, Our man, Pat, said, I'm cold. Put more blankets on me. He's been in ICU for a month. Been under a coma. Now his eyes are open. He's moving his hands. He's talking some. So we've seen a progressive healing. Amen. Seen God doing some things. And that confidence. Keep believing God. Amen. Keep standing. Keep believing. In front of you is a tithing offering envelope. Have confidence in God that when you tithe, God is going to bless you. Amen. Over, But know this, that your tithing has to do more with your confidence in honoring God. To honor God. And online, amen, go to holywild.net. Amen. www.holywild.net. You can give online there through the website. Amen. Thank God that our, our online giving is picking up people. I understand now. I'm not fighting with you no more. Amen. You don't want to write a check? That's fine. You don't want to give cash? That's fine. If you want to use your phone? That's fine. Hallelujah. However you want to do it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Just learn how to be a giver. Amen. Stay that way. David's going to come up and make a few announcements. I know the, the mud heads are getting together next week. The mud, and I'm, I'm sorry, the four-wheel drive outfit. Hallelujah. Off-road, that's it. I, I'm sorry, not mud, mud heads. Misfits. Mike, you a cooking machine, man. Amen. September 19th, Muscle Car Sunday. Yeah, that's a new date now, so we got that down for all the food we're going to be cooking up. But one month away from Easter. One month away. So I'm sure the children will have a program for the kids for that. And we'll have service in here. And, and I love, Sue, I don't know how many years we've all been together, but I preach when I get to Easter. I, I, got, to, I got to bring it toward Easter. I got to get us to the cross. So next week we start moving toward the cross again. I don't know if it be Gabbatha or the guest chamber or Gethsemane, but we're moving toward the Golgotha. Amen. Going to get you to the cross. Ain't nothing more powerful than the cross. Amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. Remember to give online, um, our holywild.net. Pastor talked about it. Uh, any way you can. It's just, uh, I, I can't reiterate this enough. It, when you give, it's not for the church. It's for you. I mean, yes, obviously we use the money to pay bills and so on and so forth. But the reality is God's looking to give it to you, pressed down, shaking together and overflowing. That's why he wants you to give. Because he says when you give, that's when you open up the windows of heaven. That's when your life gets pressed down, shaking together and overflowing. But when you hold back, then he said, I can't help you. you know? <laughs> You're literally going against the thing that I have set and prepared for you. So when you kick against the gold, as he told uh, Paul, I can't help you. But when you set your life right and you begin to give, and you will see an increase. Uh, March 7th, TLCC Kids Ark Mission Trip. So that's going to be today. There is a bake good sale in the back. Make sure you guys are giving it even. Uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be right over here. Uh, is it on both sides or just one side? He's checking for me. Both sides. Yeah, that's what I figured it probably was. Uh, guys, even if you don't want to take the sweets home, give them some money. Help them out. Let these kids go to the uh, Kentucky. They want to be able to go out there and see the ark. JJ, she's so funny, a little missionary. She's telling her, her teacher at school that 
you know, we're going, to, we're going to Kentucky. We're going to see the ark. She said, man, I always wanted to go see that. So it's funny how even, even our kids, they start to catch it. It's important what we're telling our kids and seeing for our kids. And this is just a good way to just bless our kids, to be able to see them. Uh, again, seeing things that they'll be able to remember and equate into faith later on. I remember when I seen, and that's, that's how we, we begin to build our faith, when we see small victories, when we look back on past experiences. Uh, March 13th will be the Off-Road Misfits. Uh, Ma- y- anything you want to say about that, Mike? Coffee and donuts. Sounds like a good time. And it's really just to invite your friends so that we can begin to meet and uh, mingle and hang out and so that they can see what we're all about and they can see what the church is about, what the Misfits is all about. Uh, it's just another another chance for outreach. Uh, March 14th, Daylight Saving Time. That will be next Sunday. Spring is on its way. Spring forward your clocks on March 14th. Don't be late for church. That's what Pastor said. If you ever notice this, Pastor will never say nothing whenever it comes to fall back. But because if you show up an hour early, he's good. We're good. You show up an hour late, it's a bad deal. So again, next week will be daylight saving time. And again, uh, Easter Sunday is coming up. Um, it looks like it's going to be April 4th. So keep that in mind. Uh, Easter is coming up. Um, uh, one thing I will say about that is Easter is one of the greatest outreach opportunities we have in this church, in, in any church, really, because there's something about Easter. People are just willing to go to church. And so I encourage you guys, invite your friends, invite your family. Uh, it's always obviously a good message, but it's a message of repentance. It's a message, the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross, but he's not there anymore. Thank God that we're not Catholics. He's not on the cross still. He's off the cross He's good. He got up out of the grave, I promise. If not, we're wasting our time. Amen? So just remind people that Sunday, April the 4th, is April. Invite your friends, family, co-workers, whoever's out there. Just continue to invite them, give them opportunities to, to see what this church is all about. It may not be their cup of tea, but it might be. And so that's the ones we want. Amen? Anything else? Two or more on Tuesday night. That starts at 7 o'clock. H? Anything you want to say? Be there, B square? Amen. Yeah, definitely put, put your prayer requests in the box. If you want to get baptized, there's a bunch of different things in the bag. Just make sure you slip in those things in there. Let us know what's going on in your lives. SWAT meeting uh, will be Seniors with a Purpose meeting and a Bible study. It's every second Sunday, and that will be next week on the 14th. That'll be next week. So, uh, guys, come meet with the riches, hang out, have coffee, food, fellowship, and just continue just to um, meet with one another. You know, fellowship wherever you can. Find a place to fit and fit. Amen? Continue to get plugged in in the church. Today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Lord, I bless everybody in here. I just pray that you would allow them to have incredible weeks. Lord, let them to be able to understand and know that you go before them. Every place that they go, they're Feet tread is holy ground because they're there, because you have gone before them. We love them. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Get your kids.